Oh, Dan. Dan, Dan, Dan. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Not So Common Podcast. Returning is Pixel Dan. He's a big time toy reviewer on YouTube, and he recently launched his Toy Explosion series, which looks at different toy lines and their release launches. Welcome, Dan, to the show. Welcome back. Thanks, man. Big time toy reviewer. That's that's a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're one of the early ones, right? You're sort of the OG. I get, yeah, I guess you could definitely say I'm one of the OG toy guys on YouTube for sure. You're like the AVGN without all the fame and fortune. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> do you have, do you feel amongst the sort of a newer uh, toy reviewers and up and coming younger ones, do you have sort of that sort of OG respect you feel when people look up to like, hey, you're, you're like a ground, you know, you're, you sort of broke ground in this genre on YouTube. Do you feel that? I, you know, so, I do. And sometimes that makes me feel a little weird. It makes me feel old, first of all. And, and there's always kind of that fear that like, oh, maybe, maybe my time is up. <laughs> You know what I are mean? you done? <laughs> well, you well you've been out you've been out as long as I have, right? Like ten years, right? I just hit ten years at the beginning of this year, so yeah, I am I am quickly approaching the eleven year mark now, which is insane. Oh, you are okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess technically I got on and started doing stuff on YouTube at the very end of two thousand seven, but I okay. considered like two thousand eight kind of like the start of the pixel dan channel so like pixels of pixels of plastic that's when that's exactly from pixels to plastic kind of launched right around january 2008 and Mm -hmm. yep it's been going ever since well the channel's been going ever since been doing all kinds of things it's been fun it's been good you you feel like the time has passed you by you feel like you're still relevant you feel like you can still obviously you feel like you still add something new you have this new series uh, toy explosion. Well, and you know, that's part of it. Launching a new series like that is kind of my way to, I guess, try to stay relevant, but also a way to keep this fun and exciting for me. Um, because, you know, you're doing the same old thing after a while. You know how that, that kind of wears you down and everything. And and you want to find new ways to, to not only make it more exciting for yourself, but kind of, um, uh, you know, stretch your skills a little bit challenge yourself try to do something a little more creative and that's kind of what the whole point of that was so was was reviewing toys year after year just getting old or you want to try something new a little bit of both stagnation here and there i think it's definitely a little bit of both um because you know when i first started doing this channel my focus was pretty much solely on older toys that had already been been out for a long time um you know from pixels to plastic was about older video game toys and then i started talking about old he-man toys and you know from there is when i i kind of transitioned into reviewing all the new stuff which has been great i I review it's been it's been wonderful getting to work with all these toy companies directly and really getting to know a lot of the people that make the toys and kind of making a name for myself that way but i've always felt that itch to kind of go back to focusing on more of that retro stuff that vintage stuff and kind of doing more like history pieces about the toys where i can do some research and learn stuff myself and then kind of share that knowledge with people and that's always kind of been there and it just got to that point where i was like i just it's time to do something like that again i want to go back to that well you may have gotten a little nudge or two from a couple of us (laughs) sure that's for sure all the conversations we've had in hotel rooms me you and norm about this exact same thing uh, so that, yeah. defi- that definitely helped push me in the right direction. We are definitely a strange trifecta, the three of us. We, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole other conversation. We, all three of us have sort of like these Venn diagram personality traits that barely overlap at points, but right. most of our personalities don't. So it's an interesting trio. Like the three, the three stooges of YouTube almost when it <laughs> comes down to it. Yeah, but, yeah. But how, well, so you saw a need for, you know, do something fresh and different. How has, in your opinion toy videos changed on youtube over the past few years has there been like sort of a shift in in sort of what people are expecting or has there been people getting tired of the same old same old well uh, you know i don't know well obviously there was the big boom period and i think we talked about this last time there was the big boom of all the the kids on youtube doing those types of toy videos and those just dominate um on youtube there's just no way around it and obviously part of that is because those are the ones that are targeting kids specifically sure and that's just gonna get more views it just is I'm- there's more kids watching youtube than 45 year old exactly and that's just where we're at and that's one of those things you i just have to accept sometimes i look at those videos and it gets discouraging when you see they've got four million views and it's just 
a kid playing with some toys and I'm putting tons of research and work into my videos and I'm getting, you know, 20K, 30K views. And it's just one of those things where it's like you just got to sit back and realize that my audience is completely different and that's just the way it is with this stuff. And I've had the privilege of meeting lots of people who watch my stuff and tell me how much it means to them. And that that's all that matters to me. Like if people, if people enjoy what I do, then I'm doing something right. And I just have to remind myself of that every now and then. Well, on one hand you accepted that it's a niche market, so it doesn't drive you crazy. Like, why don't I have more views? There's just not, there's not a huge audience for it on YouTube. On the other hand though, that has sort of handcuffed you to a point because you've never gone, you've never untethered from your you know, regular daytime job, correct? That is correct. So yeah. Does that frustrate you in a way that the fact that if you say had five times as many views per video, you might have been able to have done that? Does that you don't think about that? You still just get the enjoyment out of it. So for you, it's like half hobby, half professional. You know, no, I, I, you know, it's absolutely frustrating. <laughs> I'm okay, not it even is. gonna lie. I'm because you, because you don't, because you have a positive attitude when it comes to stuff more so than than myself and others that I've seen. Yeah. That. You, you, you keep a pretty stiff upper lip and you, you keep pretty positive. Well, I, I definitely strive for that. I strive for positivity and that's kind of my my goal and my motto even in my videos. You know, like I'm, I'm a very positive person because this stuff is fun and it's supposed to be fun. So I try to have fun doing it. But that's not to say that I, I don't have my moments of pure stress and anxiety uh, because this is a full-time job for me even though I work a full-time day job because I spend just as much time, if not more, uh, working on the Pixel Dance stuff. Um, but it, it's it's a passion thing. I love doing it and and I enjoy doing it. But that's that's where the frustration comes in with going back to those views. You know, you see all those families doing YouTube full-time. That's their only job is turning on the camera and playing with toys with their kids. And so that's where it does get frustrating because I do still feel like I need to have my day job because it's stable. It gives me insurance for my family. That's important. You know, I have a young son and, and so that, that is very important for me. But if I could, if I could dedicate all my time to this, man, sometimes I just think about like, the stuff I could accomplish if all my time was dedicated to this. Did you ever calculate that out in your head about the potential if you took a you took the risk, the calculator risk, and did that? It's if you yeah, said if you tough. said if you said like say for example right now you spend what twenty five hours a week on Pixel Dan is that fair to say a little bit more? I think it's fair to say that or a little bit more for sure. I mean and I spend pretty much most of my evenings and the majority of my weekends working on this stuff. So so if you put forty five hours a week towards it or fifty, would that have made it possible or is that something that you still weren't willing to just say take that sort of leap of faith to say this can be a thing if i you know like i guess i guess it's it depends upon what you what your know, risk first reward obviously yeah I absolutely guess, I guess, I, I, i'm guessing what you calculated the risk that was a little too high in, that term, in terms of that market i, I was i'll market. tell you i was really close to pulling the trigger probably back in 2014 2015 because that was like best years on YouTube, at least as far as my whole YouTube career has gone. Um, that was just like a high point where like, I mean, everybody was doing good then and the revenue was nice and it was, it was looking like it was possible. But, um, as we all know, the, the landscape has changed a lot and it's been, it's been a lot harder ever since then. And it was kind of when, when I started seeing those trends and those declines that I pulled myself back and I just, I, you know, I just decided, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm too scared, I guess. Basically, I was too scared to pull the plug and, and I didn't do it. Um, it's It's been hard because I guess it's one of those things where like I need to find an alternate revenue stream for this sort of thing. You know what I mean? But I've always been kind of that guy that's like, I don't like asking people for money. I don't like trying to I don't talk about the money stuff a lot. You're getting this out of me right now. I rarely talk about the money stuff publicly. But that's the reality. You need money. We're, we're artisans, right? So we don't do anything. We don't do anything that contributes to people being fed or people being housed. You know the basics of of, of common life. We are, we are, have to be. We are an extraneous expense. So so that said, we need that sort of money to build into our own. Uh, our own personal economy so that we can create the entertainment that people want. So money's a natural part of that, you know? So 
if I do, if I wasn't making any money at all from the podcast or Pat the NES Punk, then there's no way I could do it. Obviously, because time is money, and that and that that time can go into something else. So it sounds like you could have swung that way if a couple of things sort of shifted one way or the other, or if you if you asked Norm for a few bucks here or there, maybe to help out, that might have been possible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, honestly, I think a big, a big influence though, is the fact that I have a family, you know, having a kid really kind of just, it scared me more to do this full time and and not have a stable, uh, income. And I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of what made my decision like concrete on that. Now, obviously if I could ever get to that point, I still would. I just, I don't know. I'm in a, I'm in a restructuring phase right now. I think with the channel, you know, launching the new show and trying some new things. And I, I think, I don't know. I'm kind of laying the groundwork for a, a different path, maybe with with the channel. So we'll see. Is that something you can share besides Toy Explosion? I mean, <laughs> I want to share. Um, Do you have other show ideas lined up? I guess that's what you're getting at. Well, I'm. Let, let's 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 play with toys on Twitch. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what's gonna? Which probably should be a thing, to be honest. We're gonna make that yeah. happen. This, that borderlines on being creepy, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're like let's play with toys on on twitch people watch people eat on twitch I that's know. the whole thing so that's i mean nuts have you tried have you thought about that what could you do like a live toy show on twitch would that be a possibility maybe and i've been dabbling into the live streaming thing kind of for the first time recently um where i kind of do like uh usually what i do is kind of like a live almost like a hangout thing where like i if i've got a bunch of toys i need to open up I flip on and do a live thing and I basically just hang out with people and I open toys and I show them the things I'm opening. And it's almost more like a let's hang out and chat with Pixel Dan kind of thing. And it's it's fun and people seem to really like it. And just recently I I was working on my my display in my toy collection room and decided to turn on the live stream while I was doing that. And people loved that, like just watching me like set up the toys and showing them the way I was displaying things. And so I don't know things like it, it's weird. It seems weird to me, but people seem to really enjoy doing it. And I do like interacting with people. I think that's, that's kind of one of those important things that uh, sometimes I forget to do with YouTube because YouTube is so personal, right? Like your, your fan base feels a little more personally connected to you. So I think part of being successful is being able to interact with them pretty regularly. So, so are you are you close to an, being an affiliate on Twitch? Or are you is that you know I've never years? I've never actually turned on Twitch. I've just been streaming on YouTube. Oh, okay. So I don't know. It's it's one of those things where I worry. Like my audience is already on YouTube. Should I jump over to Twitch? Do you think that's worth it for something? That's like what it? a lot. That's what a lot of people do. Twitch's system is more robust, from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, plus, plus you have social media, Facebook, and you have Twitter, and people find there. You can tell people to catch you on there. That's true. You know. That's true. I think I think a lot of people have both. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like Norm. Can Norm, you like Norm, Norm's doing the Facebook, Facebook thing? But also, yeah, Norm's been you, doing awesome on the Facebook thing. In theory, you can cross stream. I think it's frowned upon. Like if you're if you're like you're on Twitch and you get partnered, unless you're someone very special, they will not allow you to cross stream. Um, obviously, uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. I wouldn't worry about building up the audience on Twitch versus on on YouTube. But hey, either way, you know. You know, go for it. Do that interaction. I'm always down to try new things, so maybe I'll give that a shot and see how it goes. I think that it could be fun. Well, so, so are there other? I guess we'll just say non-children toy reviewers that have thrived and have gone, you know, big time and have been able to do do it full time. Um, you know, I know a couple of other guys who are um, around my level or even a little past me who have done it full time, but are no longer doing it full time. Um, So they tried and they found out that this wasn't sustainable. Yeah, I think so. With the climate and everything on YouTube, I think it hurt them. Um, I don't, I mean, there's probably some guys out there who do it full time, but I honestly, I don't know if I know any personally anymore that do not in the toy world. I know a lot of you guys. In the, I know a lot of you guys in the video game world that do it, but I think it's one of those things. Well, a lot of us diversify, though. I, I, we have, I guess, more chances for diversification. There's, you know, this, I guess it's you know people that uh, stream games. It's easier to stream games and stream stream playing with He-Man figure. Yeah, exactly. Getting, getting, sponsor, getting sponsor getting sponsorships for like I don't get them usually, but other people like uh, Billy's gotten like mobile game, you know, sponsorships or ad, advertisements, things like that. So it's a it, I think that video games too just has a broader 
reach. I mean, you know, it, it, toys sure. toys are obviously going to be popular with kids, and there's always going to be a collector market for that sort of thing. But video games reaches everybody. It seems like you know, there's a much bigger audience for that. So, but is, but is there sort of the same sort of percentage of divide between modern toys and retro toys versus modern and retro games? Is it like a small niche thing? I would, I, yeah, definitely. Um, the there's always the guys who prefer to collect the vintage stuff, but it's definitely, from what I've seen, it's definitely more niche compared to modern toys. Um, and, you know, just from my own experiences reviewing stuff online, like, it's fun talking about the vintage stuff. And that's, you know, that kind of hits my age group with those videos. But if I'm doing a video about a brand new Ninja Turtles figure that just came out, that's going to get way more hits, most likely because it appeals to uh the kids and you know current collectors and current people that are out there buying toys the the modern stuff definitely seems to get more hits generally than the vintage stuff does so do you see sort of your audience becoming uh, on average they're becoming older and older in terms of, you know, people are your age, we're getting to late 30s, early 40s, He-Man collectors, Transformers, even Ninja Turtle people are getting older mm -hmm. uh, from the vintage late 80s, early 90s stuff. So do you see just getting aged out of that demographic? Do you see that happening with the YouTube audience? That's It's definitely something I've, I've thought about. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think that's why I still want to maintain a balance of doing a little bit of everything like I do, because I still like talking about the modern toys, too, and stuff like that. And I think that's that's kind of a key to keeping successful with this sort of thing, especially in the toy world, is I still have to kind of talk about the new stuff and the modern stuff. And plus, one of the big things, one of the big reasons people come to my channel still is my reporting from places like Toy Fair and uh, San Diego Comic-Con where the new stuff's being revealed. I mean, those are February and July are two of my biggest months on YouTube every year because I've kind of set this, this you know, standard where people know to turn on my channel and watch this coverage of the new stuff. So I, I'm going to keep doing that for sure. I think, I think I have to keep doing that. Is there any other diversification that can happen? I guess with toys, it's a little tougher. Obviously, you can't stream toys. It's a little, or you, you could, like you said, it could be creepy streaming muscle men. Yeah. Or, you know, literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, but is there anything else out there for toy reviewers to do, even outside of YouTube? Is there any, you know, doing your own toy line? Is that a possibility? Doing, uh, you know, uh, books, doing a podcast. Is there, is there any popular toy podcast out there? You know, have you thought about things like that? Yeah, I have. And there are there are some toy podcasts out there. And I've, you know, I've done my own podcasts, too. I, I actually I'm, I haven't recorded in a long time, but I do a show uh, with my buddy Jonathan called the Geek Easy podcast, which is kind of just like an all geek oh. type podcast. It's been almost a year since we've recorded, but we've been talking a lot lately about trying to get that back on track and going again, because I've had a lot of people asking where it went. So obviously people cared about it, which was pretty cool. But we talk about toy news and comic book movies and all kinds of stuff on that show. It was it, That was a fun way for me to do something that wasn't just the toy thing nonstop and talk about these other things that I like. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple guys. I, well, I know several people who kind of make their own indie toy lines, and that's definitely something I've been... I've been working with some friends of mine who make toys about making a pixel Dan action figure. So we'll see if that comes to fruition soon. I think that might be something fun, <laughs> just something silly and fun that maybe I can bring with me to some conventions and stuff that people might get a kick out of. Um, but um, I have been actually doing a lot of work off of YouTube, trying to find another path in this whole toy thing that I can't really get into specifics about. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been teasing the heck out of it on social media. So some people who follow me probably oh. have an idea of what I'm working on. And man, I wish I could tell you all about it right now. I really do. But there's certain, man. there's certain things. Man, why do I have you on then? I know. I know. <laughs> it would have been great if I got the okay to reveal this, this big special project that I've been working on this whole year. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm excited for it. It's something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. It's for a <laughs> brand that I care very much about that I've always oh. wanted to, that I've always wanted to work on. 
Um, and, and an opportunity <laughs> presented itself to me and I've kind of been running with it. So, all right. I wish I could say, <laughs> but I will okay. say that that's, but that, that totally ties into what you're saying because like I am actively right now working to find alternate ways to do this outside of just the YouTube thing. And that's, that's sure. part of it right there. That's part of it. So. And, and you see that obviously with not just people that you're friends with that are on YouTube, but others that in your genre that, yeah, like you said, it's people that used to do it full time. that can't do it full time anymore. It's, you have to diversify and try to try to get it out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just one of those I, things where like, I, I if I want to stay relevant and I want to stay doing this, I have to constantly keep finding new roads, right? New roads to travel. That are you in encouraged? Business. Are you encouraged by shows like the toys that made us on Netflix where it's like, wow, that's interesting. They, they're doing something really special. I could sort of get in there. And, and, and I guess the, I guess that's been pretty well accepted. The series that's all oh, they have to have two series. No, I think it's great that that stuff is going mainstream. Um, there's always that part of me that sees stuff like that. And I just go, man, that should have been me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I've been the toy mm -hmm. guy for all these years. Um, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, no, but I still think it's great that it's going mainstream and that we're getting more of that kind of stuff out there. Um, I will say that one of the things that kind of is hard for me when it comes to stuff like that is, you know, shows like the toys that made us, they're made in a way where the narrative is more directed towards the general public who might just remember these toys rather than the people who are actively collecting the stuff. I feel like, um, because specifically watching that He-Man episode, there wasn't anything in it that I didn't already know. Plus they skipped a whole bunch of stuff that I would have included. Plus they kind of well, made fun of the, they made, they kind of made fun of the property a little bit. That makes me go, Hey, wait a minute. I like this property. You know what but, I mean? But, but it's, it's, edu it's an edutainment though, right? You're right. right? So you're you, right. You, they look at the general audience. Exactly. And that's what they should do. And that's, unfortunately, that's what you have to do in order to kind of, you know, get that mainstream attention. And that's always been my problem because I like to come at it like, here's all the information about this stuff. And it's probably not as exciting to the people that aren't collecting it. You know what I mean? Sure. So. Sure. But I think it's good. Here's the esoteric. There. The esoteric, you know, He-Man variant from South America that yeah. people care about. Right, yeah. Here's all these wacky yeah. variants from different factories and, it's and like, the general public does like, not care. <laughs> it's like me talking about me talking about like NES game label variants. It's like most people are like, who the fuck cares that there's like a his hat's a different color on the label? It's like who cares? Yeah. It, it's it's the min it's the minutia versus just the general knowledge. Yeah. So like when I watch the Star Wars and when I watch the uh, GI Joe episodes. I knew ninety percent of that stuff because I used to collect both of them. But they, you know, but they still included stuff like Blue Snaggletooth, for example. It's like, oh, that's cool. They they managed to toss it in there real quickly. That's pretty esoteric, but well known amongst collectors. And you know, and I had a lot of friends, like personal friends, who they know that I'm into the toy thing, and and they're not like toy collectors themselves. They all called me up and were like, oh, I watched that documentary on Netflix and I loved it. You know, so they they thought it was fantastic. Yeah. So. It was for them, so not, so not necessarily so for me. Gonna, <laughs> so what are you going to sell out and do that sort of series so that people can actually watch you uh, by and mass and support you and get that get that YouTube dollar? I think that's my problem. <laughs> I feel like I can't. I don't know. I have a hard time. You can't do it. Selling out. You like can't that, do the I top. Guess. You can't do the top ten weirdest toys of the eighties. All right, as a video. Let me yeah. tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. Okay. I don't think I've ever really told this story publicly, but I think it's okay to, to tell this story now. So this is why uh, you're here. Yeah. So, uh, probably this is, gosh, this was so long ago. Now this had to have been a good six years ago, probably maybe more. Um, but, uh, at the time I was doing videos with, uh, we were doing some toy videos with a couple of my friends and, uh, my friend, Jason Duvall was doing stuff with me and we both got contacted by some producers who were behind some of the shows on like the food network and stuff. And they were interested in what was what all the, the, the toy videos that I was doing and everything. And they kind of mm -hmm. pitched the idea of doing some sort of pilot to try to sell to a network and actually get on TV. Right. So this was exciting. Okay. And ha I had several meetings with these guys and we discussed all these different topics and even shot kind of like a little sizzle reel and all this stuff. And so they, they took it to these meetings and what kept happening is they kept coming back from these meetings. And every time they would come back, it would like more and more, they would say, okay, the networks want pawn stars, but with toys, 
the networks went storage wars but with toys so they kept wanting to like alter it from like a show about toys and toy history to us haggling and trying to find the best prices on toys and stuff like that right and it kept Which like funny because that, that, that toy show did come out eventually with the guy doing that that's where i'm getting area. that is where i'm getting so like <laughs> so so we had these several back and forths and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and it just got to that point where they're like well basically they just wanted to to shoot this whole thing we're like oh we'll create this environment we're like you're going in and trying to buy stuff and sell stuff and blah and i was like but i don't do that i don't buy things and then resell them that's not me i just don't think this is going to work out so it never went anywhere and it wasn't very long after that before toy hunter hit tv now toy hunter that's a that, that's a real toy collector i forget the guy's name but i saw a couple jordan hembro jordan hembro yep so he's 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 pretty well known dealer actually he's a toy buyer and flipper or whatever dealer toy dealer he's been around for a while doing this sort okay. of thing um so you know that premise was right up his alley because that's what he does already but i just remember when mm-hmm. that show debuted i was just like that should have been my toy show there it is there's the show oh. they wanted me to do <laughs> How come you never told me that before? I mean, it's good that we get this out now. Yeah, I, I had like a non-disclosure agreement, but I think that was only for a year. So I think that expired a long time ago. I don't uh, know. Whatever. Yeah, I just I just never really talked about it. So there you go. There. I did. I, I did watch. He, yeah, he, he was based, I think, around Jersey because I think a few of the episodes were in Jersey. Uh, the first episode was Jersey Shore. I remember the one episode he got the um that the sit down uh, speeder bike Return of the Jedi toy, which is incredibly hard to find. The pedal speeder bike. He got that in one episode. But yeah, that was all. That show was all about just getting toys and flipping them, basically. Right, and that's and and you know a lot of people like that show too. So I'm not telling anybody that it's not okay to like that show because I think it was totally fine. But it's another one of those shows, just like the toys that made us, that was made for uh, a different audience. I think almost. Sure. Yeah, this was 2012 to 2014. It was on for three seasons. That's when Pawn Stars was at a zenith, and that's when you had like all those uh, shows were hot at that time. Yeah, the the two guys that are that hunt for the freaking. antiques what are those two guys called you know stuff that me you know we i, I watch with frank you know what i'm talking about the show that billy and jay decided to turn into the game chasers <laughs> yes that show yes kind of sure I- it's still on it's on is it on it's on like a and e i think what the yeah, hell is well, that show? I, I liked watching that antique hunters or something what is it called <laughs> I can't even remember the name of it now. How? What does that say? I like. Oh, what the hell is it called? Well, they have American Pickers. American, American Pickers. Pickers. That's yeah, the yes. name of the show. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Totally. Um, but yeah. That's when all those shows got big. It is. Yeah. But that's that's okay because that's just one of those things that it, it just wasn't me, you know. So there, there you go. There's my moment of. By the way, American Pickers is still on. There's been 263 episodes. That's of American amazing. Pickers. Hey, sh- people like holy it. Holy shit. People like it. 19, se- 19 seasons in like nine years. The Game Chasers I don't know how that is still works on, out. too. <laughs> the Game Chasers is still on. on. <laughs> They're still on the YouTube. Flea Market Madness, people every convention is like, hey, pal, where's the Flea Market Madness? So people like to watch uh, sort of, I guess, monetary deals or something about that. There's something like it's that it's almost that like that gambling aspect. It's like, oh, who's gonna be made? Who's gonna lose money? Who's gonna make money? It's 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 almost, um, I guess, a, like a basic instinct, right? Yeah, who's yeah. gonna so make I, the upper hand in the deal? I I post toy hunting videos, and there's people love those. People love the toy hunting videos. I just put one up actually with Melvor not too long ago. So me and me and Melvor and Chief are hunting for toys, <laughs> and people love that stuff. So all you had to so all you had to do was sell your soul, and you could have been on what is it A and E or Travel Channel or whatever, and you you would have paid a paid a small amount of money, and then you know you would have lasted a few years, and then would have came back, and maybe you would have got another deal. Now did this individual on Toy Hunter ever do something after that on Network TV, or was that it? For him. You know, I think Jordan uh, Hembro. Jordan Hembro. I think he's actually still trying to make new seasons of it happen. But I, I think they're doing like internet stuff or or maybe even overseas at this point. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Um, but I think he's still working on it, trying to make more more seasons of that show happen. So more power to him. I hope Let he me does. See what... I hope he does. Find me in TV and the web. He's on Discovery for something. So okay, he's still doing stuff. All right. I met him um, at uh, a convention one year. He was actually filming for the show. So, like, he had me film for an episode, but I didn't make the cut. I wasn't in the episode. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah. So I totally filmed he, he for an episode of Toy Hunter, but I wasn't in it. <laughs> he could have thrown the OG a bone. Mm, yeah, that's man. all right. That's all right. It wasn't probably decision. wasn't even his decision. Yeah, it was probably you just... You know what? Uh, While we're on the topic of never telling things publicly before, fuck it, right? 
I was I was approached by a reality television production company. Yeah. About four years ago, I think it was 2014. About uh, still in the zenith of stuff, and they and they loved Flea Market Madness with me and Frank, and they wanted to try to do a Flea Market Madness show. I had a couple of phone calls, but never went anywhere. But he loved the fact that he loved like the camaraderie between me and Frank, and so in theory they wanted to do something like that, but they wanted more of a. They even said like, yeah, we want something more of a, like. There's like a target for something you're looking for, or some goal or theme per episode. And I told them, well, that's kind of that's kind of hard to do because you don't know what you find at a flea market. It's gonna be hard to do a show based around that. And that's when they start staging stuff, right? They'll start staging stuff. Ex exactly, which is what they allegedly did with with you know with Storage Wars in order to build up that the fact that they find something. You know, even though obviously they only show the the good units. Allegedly, they salt those st storage units. So, but yeah, that was the time, like five years ago. And there were people trying to get on TV. 2013, 14, that was like the height of this shit in terms of, you know. But this, these shows are still on. Storage Wars is still on. I'm sure, it doesn't, does, I'm sure it doesn't do as well as it used to, but it's cheap to produce. And Pawn Stars is still on. And yeah, people like these shows about junk and discovering things. Hell, Flea Market Madness was a much bigger hit than I ever thought it would be when it came out. And people still want me to go back and edit the ones I have in the can that are just sitting there. I'm just like, God. I totally, I'm the same way. I got I have like a, 13 of them. I don't have that many, but I have a bunch of footage that I filmed at like random toy shows and stuff like that that I've never edited. <laughs> I've, it's probably from yeah. like four years ago too at this point. It probably doesn't even matter. Mine, like, like, yeah, mine are from like two years ago, like the last one I shot or a year ago. Like a year ago is probably the last one I shot, um, maybe a little bit less. But yeah, it's 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 tough just because to me it's like the same thing over and over again, and there's less deals out there too. Too, it just makes it sort of a grind. But yeah, I'll, at some point I'll sit down and say, here, here's the rest of them. Here you go. We Always got off. something to fall back on and, and put me up. And I Frank guess. Will, me and Frank will walk off into the sunset. There, and that, that'll, be <laughs> that'll be the end. The last shot will be the last shot will be me and Frank eating a burrito. <laughs> Well, well, you know, it, it's kind of hard. People don't want to see some of these ideas or series end like a TV show. When you think about it, though, all these YouTube channels, and we've been around for 10 years. We've had these series 10 years of Path to the NES Punk. That's like the average TV show doesn't even last like two years or three years. Right. And we have these series that last forever. Yeah. And, and at some point, the audience moves on and or the person creating it gets sick of it. You know, even the, even the people that did Seinfeld walked away from continuing the show, and they were making like twenty million dollars an episode, and they still were walking away from it. And here I am, still on YouTube, ten years later, <laughs> and not even making a bunch of money. <laughs> ah, you're making a little bit now. The Toy Explosion videos, obviously, you're putting a lot of thought and effort and editing to that. Are are you uh, are you disappointed by the views? Are you satisfied? What do you, what do you think? What's your gut on that? So um, right now I'm I'm well I'm very happy with the reception that it's getting, and I I think it's one of those things that I'm gonna have to build up. You know what I mean? So I'm fully expecting that I'll have to pump several of these out, and maybe the word will spread on it, and and more viewers will come. Um, so I'm I'm happy with the views, but they are average for my channel. So I'm obviously done, hoping you've done three videos. I've done three episodes so far, and the newest okay. one I posted was like my biggest one so far. Like it was, uh, it, it's it's like this new episode is kind of like exactly what I imagined for the show. Like I just really like the way it came together. So well, well you know what I'm gonna say, right? You know what I'm gonna say. This is an Amazon Prime show. This should be an Amazon right. Prime. Well, it's part of my plan. <laughs> so, well, I can't you to say that, Dan. You don't have to be all coy. I I don't know. I don't like telling everybody everything I'm thinking, but <laughs> plus plus there plus there are different audiences anyway. So people are going to watch them on YouTube. An entirely different audience is going to find it on Amazon Prime. Absolutely. I want to get several of them cranked out first and done, and then I will prep them, and hopefully I can submit them to Amazon, and and if. Amazon, I'll absolutely. It. Boom, I'll get it on there. That'd be awesome. I, I, I'd say a good number would be like eight to 10 for Amazon. Exactly. Yeah, that's about what I was aiming for, uh, was around 10 per season. Because I, I don't think you could add episodes after you upload a season. You got to talk to John about that for video game years. It's a little bit pretty final. It's not like YouTube where you just upload more and more videos. I think. I think. I'm not positive. So I talk treat, I treat him as a season. That's that's not a bad idea, though. Like if I do like yeah, 10 well, then again, seasons. Well, then again, classic game remarks uploading them every week now or every two weeks i don't know oh, yeah you oh, can look okay. into that you might be able to do a continual but i think how you really want to do it even if you could upload them every week my personal suggestion uh would be to wait until you have them all so people can binge watch them that's what people I are more, do. 
people are more likely, likely to watch all of them if they're all up at the same time versus, you know, like, that's why they wait. That's why they don't release weekly on Netflix because the likelihood of you rewatching the same series, you're going to forget. So, all right, well, you know, if you need some, if you need some help from Uncle Moneybags Pat, you know, I can help out. Oh, Moneybags what? Pat. I had no idea that was your, your middle name. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, Pat Pennybags. <laughs> But I think that could be good for you because the, the 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 price per view is a lot higher than YouTube a lot, even though they did cut the the earnings down this year. They basically halved it. It's still more money though. But and more, so like you said, it'll it'll probably hit a different audience too. And I think that's oh, absolutely what I'm hoping for. Because I'm I'm trying to treat this more like um, a show quality experience, you know? That's what I'm aiming for with it. And that's because I always had that in mind to put it on a different platform like Amazon and it's, it's just another one of those uh, trying something different outside of the YouTube bubble and see what I can do. So No, I think this show, by the way, the intro is great. Thanks. Uh, who did that intro for you? That's really nice. A good friend, Ryan Zaplinski, who has been my animation guy for almost the last 10 years total. He's been there wow. with me. Yeah, he's he's been amazing. So this is a good time to give him a proper shout out because I don't think a lot of people really know that. But it's funny because um, he we kind of met each other by accident. Uh, because man, a long time ago, uh, he just made a goofy parody video of one of my He-Man reviews where he basically like, like it was a funny video where like, I was like posing these figures side by side, showing the articulation. So he did a goofy edit where he made it look like they were dancing with each other. And he put like some mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, music with it. And just, he made a really silly video and he put it up and after, and I found it like people shared it with me and I thought it was funny. So I shared it out. And then right. after I shared it out on my social media, he reached out to me and he was just kind of like, hey, I'm glad that you thought that was funny because I really enjoy what you're doing. And I just did that for fun. And we got to talking and then boom, it just turned like he's a graphic design guy. That's what he does. And it just turned into this relationship from that moment. So he's been like he's he does like the Pixel Dan intro that you see at the beginning of all my videos. That's him. Like all my intros for my Comic Con coverage and my Toy Fair coverage. Like he does all that stuff for me and has been for a long time now. Very nice. Now, if you start to focus more on what maybe the audiences on Amazon might want versus YouTube, would you do more like a general toys that made us overview of certain lines or consider doing like, hey, here's a, you know, here's a 15 minute history of Star Wars figures. Here's a 20 minute history of, you know, G.I. Joe figures, you know, the, the real American hero line. Is that something you could consider or would you just do, would you still do things you find more personally interesting, like the the bizarre He-Man stuff? Well, you know, and, and that's, I think, kind of the beauty of Toy Explosion is I'm trying to include a little bit of all of that stuff in there. The new episode is an overview of the launch of the Toy Biz Uncanny X-Men toy line. And mm -hmm. so I treated this one more like a overview of here's how this line launched. Here's how it came to be. Here's how it spawned into this massive boom period for superheroes and superhero toys of the 90s. So that one is more of that kind of, I, I feel like, that type of video that would be more geared towards anybody. And so I'm doing a little bit of both with Toy Explosion. And I've almost kind of considered, like, when I do the upload to Amazon maybe only including those type of episodes like the X-Men episode, because maybe that audience will appreciate that stuff more than the episode I did on like the obscure Argentina He-Man toys. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> safe to say. <laughs> yeah. You might be better off doing like a history of He-Man video. So like, like the like, first episode I did was yeah. like a overview of the history of Fisher Price little people. Sure. And then, and then episode two was weird because I looked at these weird variants from Argentina for He-Man. And then the third episode, I went back to a history type video. So if I kind of alternate my topics like that, I think that's good for YouTube, but it also gives me good content to possibly use for Amazon or something later. Sure. So we'll see. And, I have yeah. a plan. I have a thought process for this. So we'll see. We'll see how it well, goes. I, I, well, you know, I think you'll do it. I think it's, it's high quality enough for Amazon Prime. Like you just have to get the captions. And a lot of times you can download that off YouTube, but even doing it professionally is only like a, do do a dollar a minute. I was going to say, YouTube captions are awful. <laughs> well, sometimes you get away with that, but like even worst case scenario, it's a dollar a minute. I think it's even cheaper than sometimes, and you know it won't cost you that much. You'll get that money back. It's fine. Yeah, totally. You know, we, I mean, we invested that in video game years, and that was well worth it. You know, because people, as people still watch video game years, it's still watched randomly by a lot less people. But it gets into that. It gets into that ecosystem that people find it. You know. Some people might be searching for, uh, I don't know, to say a certain, I don't know, action figure toy guy that comes out. And maybe they find a series by accident. 
Maybe they find like a like a series about what are you talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a certain a certain figure, you know, toy figure guy. I'm not talking about that at all. All I'm right, not, good. <laughs> I'm not talking about that at all. But um, uh, you're gonna get how's in trouble. I, nah, no trouble. I don't, I don't even talk about. It. I'm just I don't, I don't, yeah, you're, I, you're right. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> How is the how is the uh, convention? You go to a lot of these toy conventions, like uh, you go to the ones that specifically specifically focus on He-Man figures, right? You go to other toy conventions. Has there been a change the past three four years in terms of the the audience, or what toys people are looking for? I've seen, especially with He-Man figures, they do a lot of these re-releases a lot, where they're like fashioned after the old ones, or they look similar, even the packaging similar. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's weird. It, it there's definitely kind of this um, modern trend of doing like vintage style action figures that are brand new uh there's a lot of companies specifically right now that are focusing on that he-man style which is it's cool to me because i love that style of toy so we're talking about the, the rubber rubber head and like plastic arms and legs that just so we call them like 5.5 figures because they're five okay. and a half inches is, the, is like that's the term for that specific style with the squat legs and the squat arms and they're usually muscular and Overly ripped. Yeah, yeah, overly ripped. So, like, you know, because Super 7 is the current company that's got the Masters of the Universe toy license, and they're producing, like, new vintage figures. So they're making characters that never came out in the original line that we're supposed to, and they're doing, like, figures that are in the old style but look more like the cartoon, which is something that Mattel never did. So that's ah. cool. But then you've got companies like Funko who are doing their own 5.5 figures now. They're calling them Savage World. And they're doing like Thundercats in the vintage He-Man style, which is amazing for somebody like me who always wished that my He-Man and Thundercats figures like fit together. <laughs> were, were Thundercats, were they slightly bigger? Were they six inches? Thundercats? Yeah, five, well, they were more like in the, yes, they were about six inches. They were, and they, they weren't in the squat body poses or anything. So the know, squat, so. the squat, steroid figure mold that's what's popular right now. yeah it's got like this weird well it's just like a current trend i guess because yeah, i'm looking I'm, I'm looking at uh i'm looking at super seven's website they're selling uh eldor uh and a smaller bubble and then they're selling hero yes now, i don't remember hitting the cartoon eldor now, must have been around though they right? were they were not in the cartoon they but were. they were they were planned to be a new series that spawned off from the original masters of the universe line called powers of gray skull Okay. So that's where, like, when the Masters line ended in 87, Powers of Grayskull was going to be the new line that started. And Hero was going to be the new main character. <laughs> oh, okay. Instead of He-Man, Hero. Right. Okay. So they had those prototyped and everything from Mattel, and then it never happened. So, like, the fact that Super 7 is making these figures is a big deal for He-Man fans like me. Because it's like we're finally getting these figures gotcha. that we've seen prototypes of for 30 years. And it's like they're finally happening. It's and then cool they're doing, stuff. but then they're they're doing these uh the vintage figures like they look closer to the cartoon like Tila man in arms actually having a mustache, but but and and he has two arms of the armor instead of only one like the figure had. And they got so weird robot He Man. You see that weird robot? Robot He Man. He -Man. <laughs> uh, Be Beast Man looks a little more accurate. Not fuzzy though. Not the other one wasn't fuzzy, right? He was just no, orange. You're yeah. thinking of Moss Man. He was fuzzy. He was the same. Thinking of Moss Man. Uh, sure. See, so yeah, okay, so I see what's going on here. So. And then they're doing all. They're, they're doing three and three quarter Master of the Universe uh, figures. So those like, are weird wow. because yeah. So they're basically That's doing weird. the Kenner aesthetic from the old Star That's, Wars stuff. That's really weird. It's so weird, but like I don't know. It's like a weird trend right now, and you know, it, not everybody is into it. But there's a pretty big subset of collectors so, that love that stuff. So who is the audience for these figures? It's just the old collectors like you, people that grew up with it. Definitely, these guys don't make these figures in numbers that are like big enough for like really retail stores. I was going to say, who's going to, how many people are going to buy the gray skull hero figure? Are we talking a couple of thousand, a few no, thousand? I would say a couple thousand, probably max. But that's, so, that's, so you're talking about the audience of all the worldwide uh, vintage Masters of the Universe figures at most we'll say is 5,000 people. And that might be generous. That's, like yeah. That. That's probably a good number of their production. Yep. Okay. Okay. Which is which is way less than anything you would see at a retail store. That's, that's actually considerably less. Yeah, just to put that sure. in perspective for anybody that doesn't doesn't know. Sure. If you, well, then again, there's no more retail toy stores that are mainstream. Did that? Did that? Did that? How sad was that? I know you did a video with your son, and I saw that. That was really heartwarming about making sure you go to Toys R Us and play with everything and see it. I mean, 
is that something that future generations are to take for granted that there's going to be no more mainstream obviously you're going to have the smaller mom and pops that'll stick around and might do well there's always the ones like at the factory outlet there's always a toy store sitting around there but it just makes it harder uh for families especially to find these stores when there's no more major retail locations no it's i think a world without toy stores is an awful one and i just don't understand how we got to this point honestly and it, it's really easy to blame the internet and amazon but if you look that's at not the, it though i was gonna I say if you if you do any research at all on the closure of toys r us you will see that that had very little to do with what happened there um but that's you know it, it's obviously sad for me as a toy fan and a toy collector but it's real sad for me as a parent uh, because just it had already become kind of one of those weekend traditions with my son because he's right at that perfect age now where, you know, Saturday mornings, daddy and, and Spencer would go and grab some donuts and then go to Toys R Us and we'd check things out. And it was just a fun time, you know, and plus, obviously, Christmas time. It's fun to take him and have him point out things he wants for Christmas and birthdays and all that fun stuff. Not having a place like that anymore is is brutal i hate it i hate that he doesn't have a toy store anymore because the couple aisles that you find at walmart and target is just not the same and honestly that the the biggest worry i have is how this is going to impact the toy industry as a whole because the oh, yeah. re the reality of this is a place like toys r us with all that shelf space gave toy companies especially the small toy companies a place for their toys to be and it gave them the opportunity to try new things and do things outside of the box that weren't necessarily licenses and and put all these fun things out there to find and yeah. now now you've only got walmart and target with five or six aisles dedicated to toys and they're, they're not gonna give that shelf space yeah they're not giving it they're up, only gonna try. bet on the things that they know are gonna sell which is all the licensed stuff you know uh, mm -hmm. i'm worried that the toy companies are going to stop taking chances and doing fun things and the only things we're going to see from now on is marvel and wwe and barbie and hot wheels and nothing else you know what i yeah i used to uh, the, one of the last few times i went to a toys r us they, were, they had some neca figures in my local toys r us NECA had a uh, had a toy like section like dedicated to their yeah. toys r us they ain't gonna have one at target well they actually just oh, got one really? at target yeah that was oh. it just oh. happened target gave neca a section so that's good they gave him a chance Okay. So hopefully things go. Okay. Right. okay. Well, Pat's an idiot for, for predicting that wrong. But, but that's going to be few and far between giving these independent and you know what's uh, funny toys is lines of chance. Like GameStop is stepping up all of a sudden and carrying a bunch of toys. So all of a sudden, a lot of these toys that were going to be exclusive to Toys R Us are winding up at GameStop, and GameStop's starting to sell a bunch of stuff. So that's that's kind of weird. <laughs> so. But you still have an outlet for 95% of these toy lines that saw the light of day in Toys R Us. It's going to be hard for them to even be noticed by anyone or given, like you said, given an opportunity. So that's devastating to the smaller toy companies. It's just devastating. And you know, Mattel just laid off like 2,000 people or something crazy like that. And and they kind now, of... Was that in response to Toys R Us they, partially? They put partial blame on the closure of Toys R Us for them having to lay off that many people. So 2, 000, wow. that's awful. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And you think about that. It's like, where do all those people go? Like 2000 people lost a job. Can the toy industry really find new jobs for 2000? Can they, they absorb them? Probably not. Yeah, see, that's, that's that's what scares me about toys. It's, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like newspapers closing. They're not going to those. Not gonna, there's nowhere else to go because too many are closing. That that's the downside of, of us so, losing toy stores. So that's what scares me. Out of the ashes of this. I know they've tried to resurrect Toys R Us. They're trying to buy out the trademark and everything else. I don't know if that's going to be a possibility. Do you think there could be something that happens? Maybe Amazon says we want a toy store chain and they, they get into it. I always thought Amazon, it has to be like a big entity like that that can afford to take the risk and gamble. And that and they may want that retail because those retail spaces are already there. They're already there. You just got to go and buy the space and lease it. And the shelves are still there. You know, like when I went to the fixtures, they were all still there. No one was buying them out. No one's going to buy all those fixtures. There's just no stores. There's no chain that's got to come in and replace that to even get all those fixtures, for example. So you now have hundreds of stores vacated that no one's going to pop in and use. Yeah, a small amount they might be, but overall, they're going to be gone until someone says, you know what, let's try this again, potentially. And those are all anchor stores. Me and Ian talked about this for the podcast. Those are anchor stores for that whole, you know, say it's a Toys R Us next to a clothing store, next to you know, a, a, a mattress store. No, you're totally now, right, right? There are always those, anchors in these shopping malls. It's always. And so that, so that kills those local businesses entirely because of that. 
Um, so I'm hoping someone like Am evil Amazon, we always hear, oh, it's worth a trillion dollars now. Well, they they have the capital to come in and, and say, you know what, fuck it, we're going to do a toy store. We'll call it Amazon and Toys R Us. You know, I hope that happens. I hope like, somebody there is, steps there is, up. There is money to be made. There, one of Toys R Us issues, one of the issues with Toys R Us was that they didn't go out of their way to give uh, families a reason to visit the stores. Right. That they weren't doing like activities or, or fun spots or educational centers, things like that. Like give, give, give parents a reason to take their children there regularly. Well, yeah, there's so, absolutely more they could have done. And, absolutely. And, you know, like their, their, their website was terrible. It was hard to buy from. Oh, they, that was they, bad. They should have, they should have made that easier because that, you know, like people do shop online and it does make it easier sometimes. And it was, it was very hard to navigate and find things. Um, so there's a lot of things they could have done differently, but man, yeah, I'm with you. I hope something happens. Somebody needs to step up and fill that hole because there's, I think there's still a place well, for it in this world. There, there's a news article with Toys R Us gone. Amazon wants to send out a holiday toy catalog of its own. It will be mailed out and handed out at Whole Foods, which they now own. <laughs> so they're so they're going to try it and sort of replicate the old, you know, the old uh, the wish book, the Sears wish, the book. old Sears <laughs> wish book, and I, I, I had Sears and I had service merchandise. If you remember them, um, they they had toys too. So so they're going to try to obviously recapture that market because who else is going to do that in retail? You know. Now we now Ian talked about the the idea that someone could buy into pop up stores that only exist like how the Halloween stores only exist for two months out of the year. Maybe you do a store that only exists for November I and think December. That, there was all those rumors about KB doing that, like KB coming back and doing the pop up stores around the holidays. I, I thought Toys R Us owned KB. I thought they bought it. Uh, no, they they owned. Uh, I don't think they owned KB. Did they? They owned um, FAO Schwartz. They bought. That. Oh, they okay. Who yeah. owns KB? Someone else um, does. Well, I think Bain Capital put them out of business the same way they just put Toys R Us out of business, honestly. Um, just, a, just a lot of debt shackled with other private debt. It's insane, debt. right? It's so nuts. Um, but I don't know, like, because that was big news when the whole Toys R Us thing was happening, and now it's just gone silent. I haven't heard anything about KB in months, so I don't know what's going on with it. Let's see. Who owns KB Toys? Uh, someone just owns the LLC. Yeah, that's so, all so, it is. Strategic, so, so strategic marks LLC. These fucking LLCs. They own it in name. Trademarks. They own it in name only. It's not really. Toys, Toys R Us allowed the previous registration to lapse. Toys R Us did oh, own it. Oh, they did. Okay. Okay. Founder Alia Kassoff states that due to Toys R Us going out of business, they plan to have 1,000 pop-up stores uh, running in malls across America before Black Friday 2018. But where's that? I'll see that when I believe I was going to say, how long ago was that news story? Because I sure haven't heard anything about it since, and we're getting real close to the holiday season. I will see that. Oh, I think we commented on how this was going to be so hard to do um, when we talked about it on, this, on the CU podcast. This was from March. So they're going to do a thousand pop-up stores, really? <laughs> we'll see. Why don't you start with like 15 and see if you can do that? They're Honestly, I would love to see toy stores pop up, but I just, I don't know. I don't have high hopes for that. And, and of course, it's always, you know, people that just own, the, it's these, these trademark companies, strategic marks. They don't know how to run these businesses. They just know how to acquire trademarks and protect them. So it's a shame. I, I, but you should have seen it when that news was coming up. There were two different KB Toys accounts on Twitter that were arguing with each other, both claiming to be the real KB really? Toys. <laughs> it was it was a disaster, dude. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, KB it was. War? I'm, it, I'm gonna search for that. It was totally a thing that happened. It was because like, they're because they're like, well, we own the trademark. No, we own the trademark. Um, I don't know if one of them was just a troll and the other one just decided to fight with them or what. It was just embarrassing it was like if this, the is, if this is how you guys are gonna start like <laughs> well i will put the odds of them opening a thousand pop-up stores this holiday season at about a million to one i said if they if they do like 15 or 20 that's a possibility but even even the logistics of doing that when you have no experience in order to do that not just hire a firm to do that for you get all the inventory Train the employees. I mean, this isn't this isn't as easy as a Halloween store. The, plus, those Halloween stores have been in business for thirty years, doing these Halloween stores that like Spirit Halloween shops, which they go up early September. They're gone by November fourth. They're gone. They have employees that do that, and know exactly what they're doing, and that's cheap, cheap, relatively cheap to buy in wholesale halloween outfits that by and large a lot of them don't change year to year right right this, this these are toys that are seasonal they are if no one buys them you might be shit out of luck yeah what are you gonna do with all those extra toys <laughs> this, this isn't like the same like uh a princess outfit you can sell to the same girls year after year 
Like to- toys are like, you know, the toys hot one year, no one wants it the next. So the, the risk inherent with this is huge. And they could be, they might try it once and that could be it. Even doing 15, 20 stores and realizing, hey, we didn't advertise it enough. People didn't know about it. And we, we took a heavy hit on this. So I, it, it's really interesting. But I think maybe Amazon, they do these catalogs. Maybe they've realized maybe we can do some retail stores. Maybe we can take the risk. We have the money to do it. You know, maybe they can buy out because I don't know what's happening with the, I guess the debtors decide who, who uh, you know, the Toys R Us debtors or dead ease uh, debtors decide who, who wins the name on an auction or something of that nature, who's going to put in the money, right? Because they try to, because they try to do that weird crowdfunding thing and that never went anywhere, right? Yeah. Well, they, they, the guy that owns MGA Toys tried to buy out Toys R Us and he used like a crowdfunding method to do it. Like he put in his own million or something like that mm-hmm. and then wanted to crowdfund for the rest and that that didn't get very far yeah because it's like oh you can buy a shirt but it's like well you're helping them they'll buy a company out shouldn't it be a, if i donate ten thousand dollars i should be a shareholder in this new company i just don't want a fucking shirt and a keychain for ten thousand dollars so that's where i think they went ra- wrong yeah definitely uh, uh, oh here's an article i wish i had a producer uh, Spirit Halloween opens at Old Toys R Us store. That's been so, happening a lot. I've been seeing so many people posting pictures of their old that's Toys so R Us. That's so depressing. With, I oh know, it is. It's the worst. It's like, you didn't even let the, <laughs> you, like, the carcass is still warm, guys. Well, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the funny thing about that, though, is that the spirit shops don't need that much space. So they'll probably, like, rope off the 80% of the Toys R Us that they won't use. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. It. <laughs> well, it's, it's, already, it's right. It's already September, so this is when they open up. Yeah, there's op- a, there's I a, think they're open now. There's a picture of it in Queensbury. So this is one of the newer Toys R Us where it has like the big yellow grate. Uh, you know, the, then it's the plastic Toys R Us. This is like a Toys R Us built in the past twenty years. They they went Likely. into the Babies R Us here. There's a spirit in the Babies R Us building here. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Toys R Us well, is still sitting empty, but babies well, Spirit are gets wherever they can get. Even the ones near me, year to year, they're in different places, maybe even the same shopping complex. They don't care. Yeah, you know, it they- is. It's always in a different <laughs> store every year here. Wow. <laughs> We're ready to just like end it. It's just like, this is too depressing. It is, right? It's awful. Ugh. <laughs> Would you walk into a spirit and buy a costume for your for your son, or you, you just couldn't do it? Uh, we'll probably go to Party City <laughs> and get yeah. costumes. I don't know if I could step in there. <laughs> It'll be I went sad. with my father when I went back home to Jersey in June. I went. It was literally the second to last day. I think they were closing in uh, late June. And my dad let me go. My dad's in his late sixties, and even he knew this was like a religious moment for me. I bought this little. You can't see it on this camera. That I'm on. I bought the little, not the Lego, the constructs type uh, Ripley figure you put together, and I bought a couple of um, I bought a couple of uh, I think they had like a little Animal Crossing figure they had and an amiibo, so it was like it was like fifty percent off. It wasn't even ninety percent off. It was like one day to go. I was kind of shocked they were. It was just ninety percent off everything, and they still had it. Not like total garbage. They had the whole stroller aisle was still filled with strollers. They condensed it. Someone, a, a lady brought out an old rip box Power Ranger that was probably 10 years old. That was a return to get it out there. And then I'll never forget this as long as I live. This reminded me of like the odd job, odd lot stores in the mid 80s that had all the aisles of Star Wars figures. I don't know if you remember that. I do. They had they had aisles and aisles of Skylanders, brand new for 29 cents each. Man, yeah, they couldn't give those things away. They give them oh, away. my goodness. No, yeah, I made several last trips. Cause I just kept saying this is going to be the last time. And then I'd go back in there again. Uh, but every time I went, it was more and more depressing. Just watching what, watching the way people were just picking that place clean. It was like, Oh, it was killing me, you know? Uh, but I totally took souvenirs. <laughs> so I, I have a, um, I have a Toys R Us basket with Jeffrey on it. That is now in my house in my collection. And I also got one of the old video game hang tags that used to have the tickets in them. Remember the... Did you really? Yeah, I've got one of those. <laughs> I, I, so, someone had one of those laying around? They were still... Because they still use them on, um, like, the the exact same oh. things they still used for the bicycles and for certain other, like, bigger electronics and stuff. Oh, and they okay. had just a pile of them laying around because they were, like, everything was up for grabs. And so I was just like, I think I'll just grab one of these. That's <laughs> so awesome. I, that's I took it, so... Well, that'll all be on eBay. I remember asking an employee if, if they... If I could buy one of the shirts they had on, 
they had an extra one. They said, no, nah, we don't have any shirts left. I still have my, because I worked there for a couple of years, I still have my red button up that says Toys R Us on it. So. Well, people know how crazy I am about Kitty City, about Lionel Kitty City. I have a lot of merchandise from Kitty City. I have the employee smock and the over, like the, the yeah, I have the smock and the vest from Kitty City, the employee stuff. Yeah, I saved a bunch I, of I bags have, from I, Toys R Us. I have the storage directory of Kitty City. Like this aisle's <laughs> bikes, this aisle's Oh, video that's bikes. awesome. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm a nut. I have like the color book. I have a stuffed Kitty City, uh, the kangaroo and Roo. Not our Rue. I have that. You can't find them anywhere. I found one. I was like, holy shit. This is going to be the only one left in the U.S. That exists. I was going to say, I've got my little, on my shelf back behind me, I've got, I don't know if you can see it in the video, when they have showed up. But I got my little, like, it, it's like a Jeffrey Shrine back there, there <laughs> in my go. display. Yeah. I got, yeah, I got a, I've got, I see your I got plush a one. one back yep. here. I knew so I want to stuff got, one. Yeah. I've got a plush Jeffrey, and I've got the Funko Pop Jeffrey, and I've got the Lego Jeffrey, and they're all just sitting on my shelf right there, so. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, man, we're old. Yeah, yeah I, I know. know. Clinging to these old things. I, I, you know, I, I cried. I cried. I got I, I got a little teary, teary eye leaving the store, like seeing the doors open the last time, seeing the same, you know, 25-year-old plastic shopping carts yep, there. Yep, yep. same I, ones I, from I, when I, I was. Yep, exactly. I, I got misty-eyed. It was, it was hard leaving. It was even harder, like, because my son didn't understand. Like, this is the last time we're coming here. And he would say, why? And it was just like, oh, my God. This uh, is the worst. I don't, like, he doesn't He doesn't get it, you know? No more Toys R Us. And then, and then, like, he would just randomly, like, at home, he would randomly say, I'm sad there's no more Toys R Us. Uh, and I was just like, oh, you're killing uh, me, kid. Yeah. Oh, it's rough. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's better for him to you know, get it out of the way early. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's why I made that video with him, you know? Like, I wanted to... So that was yeah. that was for me and for him mostly. I wanted to have that footage, so almost makes you want to have a kid. That yeah. would have been nice. <laughs> almost. I like. Oh it. man. <laughs> hey, I'm not saying not to have one. That that's a that was a cute moment. Uh, so what do you where do you see the future of of toy collecting going? Do you, where do you see it in ten years? Are is it are, are people going to drop out? I, how, I always talk about retro video games. How. There's, we're just going to get to a point where this is happening more sooner or later and people are starting to dump their collections. Is that going to start happening with older toy collectors too? I, I think it's always possible. Um, it's hard for me to gauge though because I feel like there hasn't been any decline in it in the past 10 years I've been doing this. If, if anything, I feel like it's gotten more popular. Um, at least more widely accepted. You know, I feel like, I feel <laughs> like, <laughs> well, kids are kind of growing up with it being cool to have toys. And I feel like maybe it's, it's a little more accepted now to be a toy collector than, you know, just like with video games, it's the same thing. Um, but I definitely think there's going to be that period, right? Because there's, it's, it's that, it's that whole thing where like He-Man and, and, and what all this stuff, GI Joe and everything like, uh, this stuff's all eventually going to kind of fade away with us. Right. Cause we care about it the most. Sure. And unless they find a way to keep reinventing it for modern kids, like, you know, they've successfully done that with Ninja Turtles and they've pretty successfully done that with Transformers. But, you know, they haven't done that with He-Man yet. So they haven't done, with G. Joe. They haven't done that with G.I. Joe. So, you know, there's a lot of that stuff that's totally just going to probably fade away with with us and it's not going to have second life but it always makes me wonder too like what are what are kids today going to look back on fondly are they going to have toys that they want to recollect again or is it going to be like they're going to have those those little fucking little hamster toys that were popular a couple of years ago what the hell were those the things? zuzu pets yeah zuzu pets <laughs> they're going to be are they going to get a, are they going to get nostalgic for skylanders you know like that is it's Sky you know what it's tough just because a lot of these toys that come out nowadays are very, you know, one hit wonders. They are. They come It's a different uh, it's a different world than it was back in the 80s. It is. Back in the 80s there was like at one time I was, you know, four or five different toy lines a kid could collect or collect they were playing with. I was playing I was playing I was playing with G.I. Joe. I was playing with He-Man. I was playing with Transformers all at the same time. And obviously and that was like the boom period of the licensing, right? With, sure. with the cartoons. But like the cool thing about the 80s is like toy companies took more chances and did a lot more weird things back then. So not everything in the toy aisle had to be a license back then. Nowadays, well, was, it seems like everything has to be a license <laughs> to get yeah, into I was, the store. I almost feel like though nowadays, yeah, the non-movie, non-superhero, non-Star Wars stuff. I don't know. It has What has been like the big major boys toy line that's popped up action figure wise that wasn't connected to a property that at least was popular 
it's tough. It's tough. Like Skylanders was huge. Um, but that was connected to something else though, right? That, that was, well, it was tied into a video game. You're right. It was tied into a video game. Um, you know, there is some creative stuff out there though. Like, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Shopkins, but those were huge in the girl aisles for a long time. And then there's like the grocery gang, which is kind of like the boys equivalent of it. They're like mini figures of like little food guys that are kind of, okay. They really feel like they should have come out in the eighties. That's, that's how cool they actually are. I I actually like, what are they they called? Grocery gang, but it's spelled G R O S S (laughs) like gross. So grocery gang. Is that like the food the food fighters we had? Yes, they're like modern food fighters. Um, my son loves them. He thinks they're fantastic. And so it's been real fun like buying those with him and everything. So there is some stuff out there that's not so like So will really there be if you had to put a gun to your head, what pro- are there properties even we'll just say even two properties today, uh toy lines for boys that will still be finally as finally remembered as and collected like we finally remember and collect like he-man and gi joe figures and transformers is there even two of them you think that'll be around i don't think i can name anything that's not like something that's been around since our generation you know wow like like kids still love ninja turtles kids still love transformers but that was but that's from our generation that's what i know that's what i mean it's hard it's hard to new it's hard to name something that's like brand new that has stuck around and been as important as those toy lines were nothing culturally relevant that's been sticking around my kid loves dinosaurs dinosaurs never go out of style that's true <laughs> going to be, di- be always gonna be plastic dinosaurs. always gonna be dinosaurs a dollar for a bag of 30 plastic dinosaurs yeah and army man is always army man. always army man <laughs> is it because there's less of a focus on uh you know we're trying to shy away from violent toys is that part of it you think is because there's no like military well yeah there's de- that well i think that's definitely Actually, what's kept gi a- joe away but i don't think that any of the other stuff is any less violent than the stuff we had i mean oh uh, yeah superheroes and star wars superheroes and power rangers and all that stuff is still very popular and that's all about fighting so so maybe it's just that there's no creativity left i think i i think it's just the fear of a license i think like it we're at a point where stores don't want to carry a toy unless they know it's going to sell and they want to make sure that there's something that's going to move it off the shelves like a movie or a video game they don't want it sitting and i think that's just where we're at now i think that's what stifled the creativity honestly which 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 makes which compounds it that there's no toys or us exactly you can't try out a, yep. you can't try out a right new toy to line on the shelf yep. all comes back to that. man that's depressing so there there might so there might never be a new ninja turtles there might never be a new transformers type of like holy shit i'm gonna remember this 30 years from now versus well this is just the hot toy of the year it's gone now like i like grocery gang might be cool it probably won't be around in a couple of years i like, know that's what i know i know you're totally right is zuzu pets still around i don't, I don't think so i think those have been out of style for quite some time has there been a new? Has there been a new Cabbage Patch Kid? Yes, this Cabbage Patch Kids are in toy stores right now. Or actually, are, okay. well, they were at Toys R Us. I guess I haven't really seen. But is there something to replace and supplant that? Is there something to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like they're still making Cabbage Patch Kids, and they have like mini figures and everything for that. that I don't know how popular it is. Maybe but it's be, out- maybe the, the Pixel Dan toy line is going to be the new thing we're going to talk about thirty years from now. Come up with something very creative then. <laughs> Hey, I've I've been I've been wanting to do a YouTuber action figure line for like years and do years. You really, do you think that would be popular in thirty years? People would look back and go, "Remember, there's an audience at least right now." For you these know, weirdos people, that used to get on the internet and talk about toys and video. You games. don't think a Norm's figure would sell? I think a Norm figure would sell. <laughs> Norm's audience is huge, so probably oh. yes. No, you, you have a big audience. I have a decent sized audience. No, you know? yeah, no, you're right. I mean, we're no Norm, but. We're no- <laughs> Why are you gonna put Norm on his pedestal for? Uh, no, dude, I'm I'm, pr- I'm really proud of Norm. He's done a lot of amazing. No, Norm, work. I, Norm, Norm's uh, Norm's gotten there. Yeah, yeah, it's really been awesome watching him build what he's built. It's it's cool. Shout out to Norm. Norm should be on Amazon Prime. Did I? Is he on Amazon Prime? He should be, with all his stuff. Yeah, I agree. He should give that a shot. I guess he's uh, got he's got a lot going on though right now, like you said with the Facebook stuff and everything. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll bother him this week, and he hates to hear about that stuff. <laughs> there you go. I, I I'll just, leave that I up just, to you. I just nag the both of you all the I, time. You, that, <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> you, you, you two probably get together. It's like fuck, Pat. Can you leave us alone? Can you just relax a little bit? 
kind of just relax. Not everything has to be go, go, go all the time. Pat wants me to do this and this. Oh, I know. He wants me to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So speaking of that, so you got something you can't talk about in the works. You got Amazon Prime maybe down the road, more toy explosion. Yeah, man. Going on. I'm trying. Like I said, I'm in I'm in kind of a new um um I don't know what I'm calling it. I guess I'm just in like this interesting phase right now where I'm I'm trying to expand and try new things. So. We're all trying new stuff, right? I I I I've, this is a podcast I've only had for a year and it's doing doing okay. You know, you get a sponsor here and there, and it allows you to, you know, grow your wings a little bit and not rely upon just the, you know, the dirt YouTube model, which in the past few months, not just me, a lot of people, you know, their their, their views have gone down like 25%, 30%. A lot of it's the older videos. They're not being seen anymore. Yeah, that's what kind of happened with me. It's like nobody's watching the old stuff anymore. And it's, it's I don't know what happened. It's that algorithm, it's not getting, I guess. It's not getting recommended. So, yeah, I think that's where it used to be the older videos would do well. Like, oh, the state of retro game collecting. That would give you, you know, a few dollars to buy a burrito and, and not anymore. Yeah, and yeah. No I always I always had like mainstays that just always stayed right there in my top ten no matter what. And it's like they've just disappeared. <laughs> they've gone away. Well, there's so much more videos being uploaded. We just need a plague to knock out a portion of the population, I always say. So get that uh, infinity gauntlet. <laughs> we'll be back to the salad days of 2014, Dan. <laughs> Man, maybe we do need Thanos. So. Yeah, well, so if Thanos succeeded, would I stick around? Would I don't you know. That's gone? that's the risk, right? Some of us might go away. <laughs> Pat's gone. You and you and Norm will be like, oh, thank God he doesn't bother us anymore about doing more projects. <laughs> thank God I can enjoy my conventions again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Thanos. <laughs> yeah, you're still doing the wrestling thing too speaking of diversifying oh gosh yeah i still do the wrestling thing too i am a busy man <laughs> keep it going oh this is great catching up a little bit i don't think i want to see you at a convention am i gonna see you at a convention you will you will see me at retropalooza in a few weeks end of september all right i'll be there we're gonna we're gonna hit cheddars for sure with, with oh more. yeah we got to hit oh uh, now are we gonna be rooming together again uh, we don't know i guess that's on jay I guess he'll be he'll be in charge of that, right? He'll be in charge of that arrangement. So, uh, we're not bad roommates. We always we, we, we end up watching all the videos of the guys that hate you, and it's fun. It's oh, always, it's, it's always fun. come on now! <laughs> oh gosh, I, I, I'm I'm waiting for the like the the guys that hate Norm to come out. Like I have, t if you search probably my name on YouTube, you'll get several dozen videos of people that can't stand me that'll be going off on me. Uh, Norm, I'm waiting for like that. I hate Norm video to come up. Uh, to watch it. There's no that, way. Is like, do you think I'm, there's anybody that could actually? I feel like he's not. He's too likable, man. If I, if not, I'll, I'll I'll make it just to have one out there. Oh, good. I'll so the Pat <laughs> Pat hates Norm. I'll create it just so we have some drama. <laughs> oh man, controversy anyway. creates cash, man. We'll do our do our own drama alert thing between the three of us. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, oh, this is great. Anything else going on? Uh, I think we pretty much covered it. Keeping busy, though. Uh, Keeping very busy. Hoping for new, some new things and opening some new paths. So, well, fingers, I'll look, fingers crossed. Looking forward to a certain guidebook. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I, well, yeah, well I'm, I'm talking about my Super Nintendo one. Not, I, not I know. Else. I can't wait for that. That's going to be exciting. Not anything else. That's a topic of one of the four books I have on my desk here, if you look closely. I'm going to write for that, yeah. right? I'm gonna write for that super Nintendo. Yeah, you you will you will be right. I'll get you a nice nice fat juicy stipend, you and Norm. For uh yes. There we go. So finally. You, you finally. <laughs> I can quit my job. Okay. So let's pump the brakes a little bit there. <laughs> well, well, I'll start I'll start like a toy toy news website. I'll pay you to write for it. Okay. Now so have you had a lot of experience playing like toy licensees on uh on Super Nintendo. You remember like the popular ones that came out. There was a lot of weird licensees on Super Nintendo. Yeah, man, there was some weird ones like Stone Protectors. Yep. Was there was uh was was Cowboys and Moo Mesa on Super Nintendo? Uh what, there was definitely an arcade game for Cowboys and Moo Mesa. I'm not I have to look to see if there was a Super Nintendo um game, but there was like Mighty Max. There was a Mighty Max game on the Super Nintendo. It was more based on the cartoon, but that started as a toy property. You know, I should I should know. I'm working on a Super Nintendo book. I should know if there, there is one. I don't think there is one. Tell me. You tell me if there's one. What about all those Barbie games? <laughs> that is that Barbie game. My there's sister Barbie used count? to. My sister used to love that Barbie game. I should just write about that Barbie game for no reason. I'm like, I'm gonna, yeah, Stone Protectors was a weird one because that was a one of those cartoons that didn't last long, right? 
Stone Protectors, yeah, it's a strange one, and it had a, it actually had a pretty fun toy line. I like it. But, well, that was uh, trolls, right? So trolls were popular for like a year and a half. Yeah, they're like, like the beefed up 90s. muscular trolls. Yeah. <laughs> I never understood how trolls came back. They were like big in like, like the sixties or seventies, and they came back. Dude, they go be, in, it goes in cycles. Trolls that'd be, always that'd has be a, popular... a weird video to do for Amazon Prime, like history, like trolls, troll dolls. Yeah, that's a, that's a good There's one. A, and a few different companies put them out, like Ace and like was it Ace put them out, and Russ. then there was another line. Rust, uh, yeah, yep. There was a bunch of them. That's right. And they had the, some had the jewels in them. Yep. Yeah. Treasure trolls. Let me go through down the Super Nintendo uh, uh, list of games here. I'm just gonna they they had uh let's see here for toys. I'm just gonna give it a quick quick glance here. Uh, yeah, there was a Barbie game, Barbie Supermodel. If you count that. Uh. I'm trying to think because Norman. Uh, Biker I just, Mice from Mars. Biker Mice from Mars. Yep. Biker Mice from Mars. I was probably confusing there. that with the Cowboys one. That's I was, probably, I was probably confusing yep. that one. Uh, That's a racing see. game, too. That Biker Mice from Mars one's like a very cool look. It's a very fun racing game. There's a lot of bad licenses. Like even movies. Cutthroat Island, that big bomb, that was a game. There was a lot of bad ones that just were on the system. Oh, man. Uh, well, Earthburn, Earthworm Jim, you can kind of count that. They had toys, didn't they, for that? Or no? One of my favorites only came out for the Super Famicom. Didn't come over to the U.S., but it's Bomber, that? Bomberman beat em on And if you don't know what beat em on is, beat em on were these little marble shooting action figures that were based Ooh. on the original Bomberman game. So, like, Super Bomberman came out, and then they made action figures based on Super Bomberman, but there were these little marble shooter guys. And then they turned around and made a video game Based on the marble shooting toys. That's nuts. Bomberman beat him on. And it even came with one of the action figures, like boxed with it. And uh, it's, J- it's really fun. I'll have to check that out. Uh, James Bond Jr., they had figures of that, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. There is a toy um, line for that. Obviously, the last action figure. I think there Hero was like had figures. Pirates of Dark Water had a toy line in a video game, it did. right? Yep. It did. Uh, not as many as I thought, actually. Not as many as I thought going through the list here. Was there a Micro Machines game on the Super Nintendo? There was definitely one on the NES and the Genesis, but I don't Yes, there was there. a couple. Yes. Yeah. If you can, yeah, you count that, I guess. Yeah, why not? You count, count that. that. <laughs> yeah, not, not as many going through the list here as I, I thought. I guess you can count Ninja Turtles, right? Turtles in Time was, and all that. Was there stuff. Primal Rage figures? There was. There was Playmates there was. made they're, them. They were cheap, yeah. though, right? They were yeah. pretty cheap. Yeah, I've got a bunch of them. <laughs> they don't see those too often. No, you don't. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, you got to think of a nice article to reference some of these. I'll put together something fun. That's, <laughs> that's a fun topic, so it's easy to talk about. It seemed like there might have been more for NES, though. Might have been more. Probably. Uh, I mean, there were some good ones for the NES, though. Like Monster in My Pocket is an awesome yes. game. You know, mm-hmm. G.I. Joe had a really good game. I mean, there was some good stuff. Muscle's actually fun, even though it's bad. <laughs> it's fun to play. The, the Tick had figures, but that was more of the cartoon. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. That was a good That was a good toy line. line. They still don't go for that much. I was going to ask you that. Are there any toy figure lines you've seen just the market just evaporate where they're not worth as much as they used to be, the old ones? Um, Besides, like, Star Trek the Next Generation. I was just getting ready to say, Star Trek the Next Generation are worthless these days. <laughs> and it's a good a, toy line. It's a really they made good a, they toy made line. made a billion of them. Man, and they marketed those as collector items, and they put numbers on the bottom of the feet and all that stuff. And now you can, you can buy them for, like, a dollar a piece at Toy Swap Store. Meet. I, I got the Borg figure for a dollar at the Swap Meet. I was like, oh, that's cool. I could buy a Borg. But they're good toys. But yeah, yeah they're they're, wor- great. they're worthless. <laughs> they are worthless. So nothing else that's dropped off even since the eighties. There's has been like a line that that just sort of dropped off. I don't know. Don't care it, it, gosh, I, that's that's just always my go-to when somebody asks me. I don't know. It's I. I feel like a lot of this mainstream stuff has gotten like overly expensive for no reason. Like mm-hmm. He-Man toys have gotten stupid expensive out of nowhere. And I and I. I think I think toys that made us had an impact on that. Honestly, you, you think know, so? When stuff like that comes out and goes mainstream, people start looking the stuff up on eBay, and boom, prices go. Up. So, do, do people hate you and shows like that because you you you, you the mainstream knows about it the same way they hate some uh, retro I have game reviewers? Had my fair <laughs> share of people accusing me of raising raising prices on. Raise yeah. the market up. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's come up. Yeah, well, now when they sell it, it's worth more. Yeah, so you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't have it both yeah. ways, right? Did him a favor. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. All right. Well, we'll see. If we'll, we'll see if the the market crashes on Silver Hawks anytime soon. If they do a revival of it, there you go. You know, but again, no one bought those figures because so they're so rare. 
I know. You know so. And plus the vac metal flaked off of them, so it's hard to find them with like good paint. <laughs> look, look at you getting technical on me. I know. <laughs> well, they were all I'm shiny, just, remember? They were I'm all just waiting for that. I don't care if mask figures uh, go up in value if they if they make the freaking uh, movie like they've been teasing for years. Oh, I know. Or, or new knows? property. Who knows if that's but, uh, going anyway. to happen? All right, we never we, we didn't get to we never got into the to the uh, the, the controversy for the new Shira show. Like we should give a shit about about that. But <laughs> I don't I don't I don't really have anything to add to that sort of thing. I just it's, it's the same the Shira thing, the Ninja Turtles thing, the Thundercats thing. I uh, whatever. If it's not for me, it's not for me. If it finds an audience, I'm happy for those kids. You know what I mean? Sure. And 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 my my way of looking at it is always if these shows come out and they find an audience and they get popular, the collectors are still going to benefit from it because we'll still get all the merchandising and stuff that we want to buy because the brand itself is successful. So might as well just let it happen. <laughs> and, and there could be another iteration of it down the line. Right. I mean, gosh, how many times has turtles already reinvented itself? I mean, it's, this is not going to be the last version of turtles. Yeah. I guarantee it. So I think the, the, the new, the new Voltron show on Netflix is doing well. They've, they've taken some liberties here and there, but it's still faithful. I think it's and good there's new toys. It's good. Yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, if, 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 if I end up not liking some of these shows, it is what it is. I don't have to like it. I don't think anybody has to like it. But if kids like it, let them like it. Let them have it. Let, let, them, let them have fun. Let, let kids them have, have fun. have fun. That's right. Let, let us have fun. I guess we'll leave on that note. Let everyone have fun. Let let Dan make a good living. Check out his Toy Explosion show on the Pixel Dan YouTube channel. You can find him there. You can also find him on uh, Twitter. At where can you they can find you on Twitter? I'm at Facebook. Pixel Dan on everything. Pixel Dan on Twitter. Pixel Dan on Facebook. Um, oh, I just started a Patreon page. If that matters, oh, so I've got what is that it? now. It's Pixel Dan on Patreon. So, well, check it out, Dan. Thanks for coming on board. I'll be sure to bother you and Norm uh, in a, <laughs> a couple in a few weeks at Retropalooza. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be table buddies anyway, or sitting right next to each other. So, <laughs> all right, take care. All right, see you, bud. There are a million things that are demanding of your time. Contact lenses should not be one of them. That's why I'm excited about a great new company called Simple Contacts. It's making the process of renewing your prescription and buying contacts, well, simple. Simple Contacts is the most convenient way to get your contact lens prescription renewed and stock up on your brand of contacts. Get this, instead of taking time off and spending hours at the doctor just to renew your prescription, you can now do it online in under five minutes. It's vision care for the 21st century. Here's how it works. Take a quick self-guided vision test from your phone or computer. It's reviewed by a licensed doctor in 24 hours. You then receive a renewed prescription and reorder your brand of contacts. It's that simple. If you have an unexpired prescription, you can use them too. Just upload a photo of it or your doctor's info and order your lenses in minutes for a great price. They do all the hard work for you. Buying more contacts has never been easier. Wish they had this when I wore contacts. It's And why should it be hard in the first place, right? That's why Simple Contacts was created. Simple Contacts offers every brand of lenses and their prices are unbeatable. Plus, the prescription is just $20. Compare that with an annual appointment, which can be up to $200 with that insurance. Ah! Shipping is free and best of all, my listeners get $20 off their first Simple Contacts order. To save $20 on your lenses, just go to simplecontacts.com slash notsocommon20 or enter my code notsocommon20 at checkout. I want to mention that this is not this is not a replacement for your periodic full eye health ex exam. You'll, you'll still need to get those occasionally, but this is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts. Again, check out Simple Contacts and get $20 off by going to simplecontacts.com slash notsocommon20 or just use my code notsocommon20 at checkout. Save yourself time, money, and the headache with Simple Contacts. Let me tell you about my partner, Flex Pro Meals. Flex Pro Meals is a meal delivery company that sends healthy pre-made meals to your doorstep. Their goal isn't to give you salad, but epic recipes and entrees you may have grown up on that they make healthier versions of. Eating healthy is a lifestyle change, so they go that extra mile giving customers the most value with realistic and yummy meal options at a good price. Flex Pro Meals provides a weight loss fat trimmer plan and a lean muscle larger portion plan for a little bit more per meal. Some of their most popular meal entrees are smoked brisket mac, game day chili, breakfast burrito, chicken alfredo, and the list goes on. They have salmon meals, chicken meals. I've had buffalo meat meals. They're delicious. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order by using code PAT when you visit flexpromeals.com. 
That's 20% off these delicious meals using code PAT at flexpromeals.com. I hope you enjoyed this not so common podcast. Thanks again to Dan for coming out and being a guest this week. Check him out, Pixel Dan on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, do so on YouTube. If you're watching this or for that audio version, the old timey audio version, you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, or wherever you use to listen to these old timey recordings. You can like the podcast, share it on social media, leave a comment. And if you want to help directly support me and my endeavors, check out my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.